Amen. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Isn't that awesome song? Don't you love that song? I, I just... It's just got Irish in it. <laughs> I just hear it. I mean, if the, if the dropkick Murphy... Became a Christian band, that's what they write. So, thank you for the one person who picked up the reference. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll be playing to this side of the room. I can see that now. That's, uh... Well, uh, happies, uh, happies. Happies to all of you. Happy Mother's Day to you. And... Um, yeah, I, I, um, we, we're going to leave probably right after I get done preaching. Each year we try to do it special for Stacy, and this year what we're going to do is take her all around the world and do six different uh, massage places, uh, Ecuador, um, Burma, uh, different places, Kuala Lumpur, different places around the world. It was a nightmare to put together, and it, and it was very expensive. We're just going to take jets, and, and still we... <laughs> Got to get her back in time for tomorrow night for our family night for special Mother's Day celebration. So, um, gosh, it was costly, um, but we love her, and I know you guys have something special planned for your mom. And, uh, <laughs> I do that every year, every year. It just never fails to delight me. Um, but this day is not a delight to a lot of uh, people. This day seems to exacerbate their sadness or pain because it's, they don't get acknowledged in the midst of, um, of all this. So I, I took a piece and, and wrote this uh, for us. For the one who has lost a mother, for the mother who has lost a child, For the one who longs to be a mom, this day fully belongs to you also. You are cherished by this community on Mother's Day, and you are in our prayers, and we love you, and our God has wonderfully not forgotten you. Indeed, he celebrates you as much as anyone on this earth. Happy Mother's Day to all of you. Well, we're winding down this beautiful So What series. Um, I've got a week today, and then Stuart's going to speak next week. Then we're going to come have the living room back again, and that'll wrap it up in time for Ed Underwood to teach uh, his three-week series on Hebrews. I can't wait for you to experience that. Um, So... As we're going through this, it has been profound to go through the message in this Ephesians section. And Stacy and I are having an incredible time going through the entire Bible in message format. But it's a paraphrase. It's Eugene Peterson's great gift to the body of Christ. And it is, but it's not a translation. And so sometimes... um, as much as this gives language that is rich to me and beautiful, I need to look at a translation to make sure it's capturing the full sense. And, and in today's case, when I, when I go to the New American Standard, it um, maybe carries a more clear picture of that passage. So I want us, I want us to use um, whatever you have in, in way of a translation today. But, but the NASB says... In this section, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. There's there's three big gets in here, and I'm going to be coming to them strong. The hope of his calling... What does that mean? What is the hope? What is this calling? He's, he's begging that we get that. The riches of the glory of God's inheritance in the saints and the surpassing greatness of his power towards us. He is um, compelled that we get that. It's one of two prayers that he, he gives in Ephesians. Um, This 
comes out of the very, very start of Ephesians. Verse 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, and that's what this is, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And I know what we do. I, I know how hard this is, because I, I, as I come to us today, I just go... Oh, I don't want to do another message where we just... So here we are again, and, and spiritual blessings. What is that? And it's in the heavenly places. I can't even get it. He's given it to us, but it's in the heavenly places. And it's spiritual blessings. I don't get it. It sounds weak. I want stuff. I need things. Spiritual blessings, what would that be? Kind of reminds me of things that sort of promise some help, but they are not really that helpful. Like herbal remedies. <laughs> I'm sorry, I may be offending someone right now. And, I, and I, look, the, the jury's still out for me on... on um, uh, what do they call them? Uh, essential oils. Essential oils. That, that, I, I think that might be true. <laughs> I think those might be real. But herbal remedies? Like, I, I, I don't know. It might be working for you, and I'm sorry. Sorry for offending you. I'm not that much. I'm not that sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll, be, I'll be just fine. Um, but echinacea, grape root seed things. St. <laughs> John's wort. Ginkgo biloba. I have been told all of those things I needed to take at some place along the way. And I did it. And they did nothing for me. And, and by the way, we shouldn't be taking warts, okay? I don't care, I don't care where you're from. I don't care if a, a saint, if it's named after him. We just, even if they put it into a pill and emulsify, it should not be taken by us people. Um, anyways, that's my view on herbal remedies. It's just not enough. And, and the truth is, herbal remedies are what we take until we're really sick and need help. And then you go to a pharmacy <laughs> where they have medications and things that can truly help you. That's what I feel like it sometimes must feel like when we... Blessed be the God and the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, bless us with every spiritual blessing and every blessing and grace. And we just go, what is that? Um, until I realize this is true. And at 64, I have learned this so many times the ability to enjoy whatever I have been given, the ability to enjoy it is the only thing that matters that much. It's not what you get. It's not how much you get or how little you get. It's how much are you able to enjoy what God has given to you. Hasn't most of life been a tutorial on things we've sought after not paying off the way we thought they should? So, maybe this will help with spiritual blessings. The capacity to merge physical reality with the longings of my soul and to walk through this life fully engaged, fully in the moment, able to drink in the full measure of enjoyment from whatever I'm doing in a state of awe and wonder, that only ever comes as gift. And the only one carrying that gift is God. So spiritual blessings apprehended, believed, trusted, leaned on, entered into, believed as real and not ginkgo biloba. Spiritual blessings apprehended are what allow me to see and enter into and experience the full measure and value of this life, even when this life becomes unprecedentedly difficult. So Paul says, 
look, you, I've given you everything you need already. You're not lacking anything. I have given you, the moment you became a believer, you have the entire nature of God living within you. You have nothing that one day maybe I'll sort of get later. You have it. But much of the time, you don't see it. You don't get it. You're missing this life. You're trying to figure out how to best leverage your experience and trying to maximize your advantage to find the exact experience that will satisfy your longings. But whatever you end up getting after much strain and sacrifice, it rarely satisfies you. You look past the event or you look to the past, comparing your state in life with everyone else, and you, you feel gypped. And it can force you to see others as your opponents then. For you're convinced that they have what you do not, so you judge them, and you find, find what they are bad at, and convince yourself that you're better so your shame doesn't feel so bad about your pitiful station in life. So these spiritual blessings are like everything. Whatever I can make sense of this life, spiritual blessings opens the door and says, now, now you're living. So how, how do I gain what I already have but don't know how to access? That's a great question to ask. How do I gain what I already have but don't know how to access. Well, you know what's so interesting here? Paul says, I've given you all I've got. I've taught you as much as I know how to teach you. I've taught you these guys all these things over and over and over again. All I'm going to do now is I'm going to do the most important thing because unless I do it, I don't know that you're going to get it. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you in front of you that you would get these things. Hmm. And so he says, um, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. God, please so that you will know what the hope of his calling is and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. He prays it. And, and in doing so, he elevates prayer to something to accomplish what nothing else apparently can. Isn't that crazy? Paul prays this for me and for all of you who have risked Jesus that in the midst of my pain or loss or failed health or regret and disappointment, that I would apprehend what I've been given in such a way that it would transcend my temporal limitations and sorrow to drink in the absolute marrow and unlimited essence of this life. All so that in my stunned satiation, I would then be able to turn to love sacrificially and incredibly well. Because I'm no longer clinging. I'm no longer begging. I'm no longer demanding. I'm no longer feeling uh, left out or not a part of or withheld from. And now I can give my life to you. Because it's what I was meant to do and it's who I was made to be. And it's all I've ever wanted to be if I could just get the other out of the way. Is, 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 it, is, it, is, it, is it naive to think that we could live such a life? Is it too late to think that? Um, he says, I, um, I pray that Pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened. That the deepest place within me, that light would shine boldly 
out. It's, uh, it, it, it's interesting. It's the, literally being enlightened. It's a perfect participle. It, it denotes uh, a past complete act having present results. So he's saying, look, that that heart, that light, um, uh, let me say it this way. It, 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 so it would have the present state that they're in a state of illumination. So I've, I was enlightened. I was given this light the moment I came to Christ. But he's saying, I want that that was, happened back then to have these abiding results that you would be illumined. That your heart would not get stale or tired or worn down or wounded <sighs> so that that light is dim and tired and thin. I want it to, to shoot out Paul's praying. Newly lit, a light in your heart that gives insight and discernment and richness and wonder and playfulness and innocence. That a light once lit would wonderfully intensify. See, it's a light that's been in you from the day you trusted Jesus. But this life, man, oh man, have not you seen? It has the ability to wear you down and dim that light to where we've forgotten what it felt like when it was fully lit. Like we can remember early on in our faith when it felt like it was fully lit. But <sighs> Paul says, I know, I know. And that's why I'm praying this for you. I love you so. And so we can find ourselves walking through life on a memory, waiting, hoping, hoping something, and, and maybe even after a while giving ourselves permission for something else to maybe fill that void that I don't feel. So I, I might even go down a road of immorality or unfaithfulness or a relationship that doesn't belong, just to bring something back to feel alive again. Or we cover up and retreat and we, um, we withhold ourselves and everybody loses because they lose what God gave for us to offer. Um, Ed Underwood, who will be here in a few weeks to teach that three-week series on Hebrews, he writes to me every Sunday morning uh, and, and, and to Mark uh, McEwen. And he, he, he happened to write this today. It's a quote from Brennan Manning that says, In a futile attempt to erase our past, we deprive the community of our healing gift. Gosh. In... Um, in a futile attempt, and it is futile, Brennan says, to erase our past, to run from our past, to get away from the pain of the things that have happened. One of the things that happens is that we deprive our community of our healing gift. I have a healing gift to offer you. You have a healing gift to offer me. You were placed on this planet to be alive and share this beautiful life that you've been given because I need you. And, and so Ed says, um, men, don't deprive your communities of the awesome potential of living with nothing hidden. John and Mark today, my dear shepherd friends, I love you and I'm praying for you right now. Um, so um, this passage, who's praying that over you? Um, and who are you praying it over? I said it before. Uh, I, I, I didn't know what to do because this passage, when, when the kids were young, it was so sacred to me, that and the chapter 3 passage, that I would pray it over them in bed while, before they went to bed. And I would say, uh, Caleb, this I want you to know is what Paul is praying. I'm going to pray it over you. This is what God wants for you. And so I'd pray it over them. And uh, so I ask now 
What would be a difference if you prayed that over? There's something in that. It's, it's crazy, too. Paul doesn't pray it for himself. Isn't that interesting? You could just as easily say, I pray that the eyes of our hearts might be enlightened so that we will know. It's like he understands it's only something I can pray for you. So I want to do that. I want to be a person who says to Matt Hoskins, um, would you let me pray this over you? And when I'm away from you, to pray it over your family. For us to be a community where we say, Stephen, I want to pray this over you. You guys need this so much. There will never be a time when you won't need it. Would you want me to do that? Oh my gosh. And, and Matt, would you do that for me? Oh, I need it so much. We need this so much. If you could see Paul, he's not just leisurely going, uh, what, what is, I pray travel mercies and uh, unspoken requests and, <laughs> and I guess that you would know the power of what? No, he's, he's saying this is what will motivate your life and bring you out of weakness and weariness and tiredness and hurt and wounding because we need you. So he says, um, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be lightened so that you would know. Interesting. Throughout this thing, he, he, he says in another spot, so that you would know him. And it's always gnosko. You can just count on it not being oida. Oida means intellectual knowledge, uh, empirical knowledge. Uh, epignosis means that I would feel intimately, that I would know him intimately. That I would, that I would know from experience of this God who loves me and knows my name and delights in me and enjoys me as we're going to see in a second. So he says, I, I, um, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened so you would know. Know what? So that you would know first the hope of his calling. You know it's not hope like in, oh, I wonder if. It's a certain hope. It, the only thing we're not certain of is when it will be fulfilled. But what is the hope of his calling? He called you. When he called you, he made you a brand new creature. He gave you a future. He gave you things to do every single day. Ephesians 2 says, oh, he's laid things out. Ephesians 2.10 for you to do every single day. He loves you so much, he says. This one's got your name on it. You're going to miss about half of them. But you may get some. And they have your name on them. And they're for you to do in this life. Oh, my gosh. So I want, I, I want you to know the hope of your calling. It's, it's not just that you're going to go to heaven someday. As much as that is true and as beautiful as it is, it's, it's more this idea from... Um, Philippians 1.6, I'm confident in this very thing that he who began a good work in you, he will keep perfecting it until the day of Jesus Christ. Every single day, I want you to know the hope of it. Don't get beaten up. Don't get discouraged. Don't get desperate because every single day is new and he says, I've got you. I'm in you. I'm actively right there. I make no mistakes regarding you. I love you as much as love you as much as my only begotten son. So don't get weary. Don't lose hope. Don't feel like this is going to be the same as it was because I, I called you not to just survive this thing and to get to heaven some day where it all of a sudden be really great, but what a horrible life, eh? No, so that you can live this beautiful, rich night life right now. So I'm praying. I'm down on my knees, Paul says. I want you to get first. I want you to know that you were called, and that means every single day he's got something for you. He's thinking about you. He's actively working on your behalf. I want you to know that hope. That's my prayer, Paul says. 
So, um, a lot of us don't believe this any longer. We're too tired. We, we, we believed it early on, but we got beaten up. But something's happened to us, and um, we see life as Pottersville, not Bedford Falls anymore. Isn't that crazy? Same town. Same town for Jimmy Stewart. But it was possible for him to see it as Pottersville. And it was also possible for him to see it as Bedford Falls. I need you to pray for me, that I would see life this way. Because I don't always. Do you, do you understand that? It's in me. It's right there. But I miss it, my wounding and my pain. And you're not going to talk me into it. Paul, this wasn't his first letter. You're not going to talk me into it. You're not going to teach me into it. But you could pray that for me, and it would make an actual difference for John Lynch. It would make an actual difference for you, David, for you, Sam. What an incredible, beautiful promise. Um, so, that I would know the hope of his calling and the riches <laughs> of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. What does that mean? I used to think just, whenever I see inheritance, I thought, oh, this is more great stuff for us. And more inheritance, I don't know what it means, but I'm sure it's great. Inheritance, I got an inheritance and it's coming, I can't see it yet. This has nothing to do with that. Now, it does over in verse 11, when he says, uh, we've also been obtained an inheritance and been predestined according to his purpose. Oh, that's beautiful. To, to have an inheritance that is mine, that I'm his son, that I am, I'm always going to be a son and nothing can take away from me and that I'm going to spend eternity with him and with you, that's a pretty good inheritance. But that's not what this is about. Look at what it says. It says that, um, and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Oh, well now. Do, do you understand what he's asking? Paul's saying, do you know what it would do to you if you understood something that's overwhelming? Paul is praying that we might know how precious the saints are in God's eyes as his inheritance. That he is glorified in his saints, that it's all part of the wealth of God that he possesses and it's dearer to him than all the splendors of creation. Do you, do you understand what he's saying? Paul's saying, I want you to know this. God has an inheritance. It's you. The greatest thing that God has is you. You're his inheritance. He goes, you, you, I know you go, are you kidding me? Certainly he can have a better inheritance than that. He's God. But you're what he chose. And he says, Paul says, what difference in it in your life would you know that you're the dearest thing to him? You're his inheritance more than any other 10 trillion yet unnamed solar systems and galaxies. What would that do to us? Me? Are you kidding me? Not me. Do you not know what I've done? Yes, I do, Paul says. So let me pray again. I want you to believe that. That you are his inheritance and nothing is more delightful and precious to him than you. Man, I need to know that. I need to believe that. I forget it and I feel like I failed and I've let him down and that that can never be true and that's why Paul's praying it, not teaching it. And then, um, and then the third one. He says, I want you to know the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. Well, now he's back to us. This power is described as according to the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Whatever this power is that is in me, it is 
the same stuff, the same warp and woof that it took to actually raise Christ Jesus from the dead. What power? This is another one that confuses me. What power? Or am I just missing that it should be like I should signs and miracles and wonders should be happening if, if I really believed enough? I don't think that's necessarily what he's talking about. It, 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 it certainly is not religious showy power, right? It's not um, bragging that we're better than the next Christian. It's not selfish power to get more than the next person. It's not the power for us to rule this country, probably. I doubt that it's the power to reverse all health issues. Um, you see, he wants us to see the greatness of the power. Not just the power. And it was always, whatever this power is, it would only and always be in accordance with the Savior who rose from the dead for you, who washed your feet, who served you, who always played the servant for you. That power which allowed him to stay in the moment for you. So I wonder if it's not the power to give your life meaning, to reclaim a servant's authority in my home, that I would, with heartfelt obedience, want to live out this life in all of its glory and not retreat, to endure suffering, to be misunderstood and still give love, to not hide, to be present, to love well, to give up judging and cynical mocking, to find myself caring about the hurting and the forgotten and the lost, to remember those who are in other lands who do not have the gospel yet, to rediscover compassion and kindness and innocence, to forgive those who you are estranged from, maybe even to restore a relationship with a mom or a daughter. Greatness in the kingdom will always be a transformation into being servant of all. That's power. That's where our power is found. That's where it will always be found if we're following the servant, Jesus Christ. All these things are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that's named, not only in this age but also in the one to come, Jesus Christ. And he has put all things in, in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Gosh, I want to learn. I want to lay down at night and I want to look around this room in my heart and I want to pray this over you. I want you to pray it for me. I need it. You need it. Oh gosh, you guys, this is not play acting. This is the difference between dullness and richness of life. It's all in us, but gosh, has it gotten covered over and dimmed in me. I need this. So what I'm going to say next, uh, take with a grain of salt because it could be the tramadol. <laughs> Honestly, it could be the tramadol, but... I think someone or someones have been praying this prayer over me. And it's happening. I am currently seeing life more vividly, and I'm giving up my rights to be right, and I am believing my delight to my God. I'm believing that I'm his inheritance and the delight of his inheritance. And the leaves on my walk with Bailey, they look different. They are more vibrant, and I can hear birds. 
and I want to alter my life to have more time for my kids and wife and grandchildren, not because I should, but because now it's more important than anywhere where I could possibly be asked to speak. And there's one person, if nobody else in the world is, is praying this for you, there is one person who's praying it. It's Christ in Paul. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. So that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are his riches, his riches, of his glory in the inheritance in the saints. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe?